What's up, everybody? This is going to be a review of Volume 3 and 4 of Claymore. Every once in a while, I'm going to combine these volume reviews. Also, the manga reads kind of fast, and I was pretty engaged in the story, so I figured I would do two at once. And I do have Whiteboard Claire for you today, but she's uh, she's not for you guys today. She's 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 too young, but I do have Whiteboard Theresa to go along with her. So I did a little uh, little artistic drawing here that you guys can see. Ooh, 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 just, yep, 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 there you go. Look at that. So I thought I thought that would go uh, hand in hand. So you know, whiteboard Claire will return, or she will be age appropriate once more. But today we got to enjoy whiteboard Teresa. So I'm gonna talk about volumes three and four, going through them and the things that happen within them, and sort of my thoughts and theories of everything moving forward. There is actually a lot to talk about. The story is picking up, so let's get right into it. First of all, I just want to cover the tail end of the little church yoma segment at the beginning of volume three, where Claire is fighting the church yoma. She's extremely injured at this point, and so she does have to conjure a lot of the Yoma energy within her in order to defeat it. I thought this was a really good concept and I like the idea that there's sort of like a limit even though there's not really there's not like a, a scale we can look at to know the limit of like using too much Yoma power to become you know to transfer into human into full Yoma like how long is it going to take. Sorry to relate this to Berserk but that's just the main manga that I've covered on this channel before but it is sort of similar to me or gives me similar vibes of the Berserker armor where the prolonged use of it and it sort of has a curse aspect to it and eventually it could take over to the point where, you know, your inner darkness takes over or whatnot. And it sort of feels the same thing with the Yoma, where we don't have an actual scale or metric to see how long it'll take before a Yoma, the Yoma blood completely takes over. But we do know that the prolonged use of it, the more that you use the Yoma powers and abilities, that sort of leads somebody into being taken over completely by the, the, the demon or whatever it is that you want to call it, you know, within them becoming a full Yoma. And I do like how, because Claire was injured, that she was she had to tap more into that Yoma power in order to be able to defeat the creature she was fighting. I like this for a couple of reasons. I think one, because it shows Claire is not invincible, that she does get injured, even though she has like in crazy like regenerative capabilities, that she does get injured, and that from time to time she is in dangerous situations where she needs to kind of increase that uh, that drug dosage of uh, of Yoma within her. It's kind of like she all of a sudden takes three scoops of pre workout and then just gets that shit done instantly. But because of that, because she does that, that leads her closer into becoming a Yoma and it seemed like she was on the verge of a transformation and it was Raki, the, the young boy character that we've seen in the manga that sort of, you know, wrapped his arms around her, wanted to, if he's like, if you're going out, I'm going out with you. I don't want to leave you and everything like that. And it seemed to help ground her within her humanity. And I don't know if that maybe is sort of like a key factor within keeping the Yoma blood at bay. The more grounded you are, the more tapped into humanity you are and then that leads into the whole idea of like okay so if the claymores are supposed to be these like lone warriors traveling from place to place battling yomas and aren't supposed to have this human connection and human attachment and they're sort of just lone warriors doing their own thing is that specifically put in place in order to keep a claymore away from perhaps returning human or being human longer like is the whole idea behind it in order to get these claymores out there to do their business so that they eventually become yoma in which you have to send more claymore so it's sort of like this never-ending cycle because we don't really know a whole lot about the organization we get a couple more clues in volumes three and four of how the organization works but i don't understand it fully and this might be some sort of like conspiracy theory within the claymore universe where it's like we need claymores to not be attached to their humanity so that they become claymores so that we can have more claymores kill those those yomas so it's just this never ending uh uh situation or ritual that they're in or whatever it is so Anyway, it seemed as though Raki was able to keep that at bay, and they kind of go off on their journey. So I did like that aspect, and I liked how, uh, again, that shows Claire wasn't invincible, and that in times of desperation, she has to tap more into the Yoma power, which is good, and sets up a good narrative, and sets up tension for future events and future battles that may happen. So for storytelling purposes, I like that. I like that idea. Um, also, the one knight character, I can't remember his name, but he actually, like, stole a kiss from Claire, which, first of all, I uh, had, like, instant jealousy reading it, which is weird because she's just, like, a couple of drawings on a page through a screen, but still felt that within me. And then, also, she allowed it to happen. And she was just like, uh, okay, you know, whatever. And she sort of just, like, accepted it. Now, for his character, that was sort of him you know, seeing her as a, a human or seeing her as a person or somebody that he respects. But it was still very weird that he just like went for the kiss, got it, and that she didn't do anything to him. Though we learn later that Claymores aren't allowed to 
hurt humans, but that's a whole other story. Anyways, that happened, and then the story begins to shift, and this is where we get into Teresa, and this uh, definitely took me by surprise, did not realize what was going on. I had no idea that we were in flashback territory, uh, so it flips over to this other Claymore named Teresa, who has a very similar vibe as Claire. She's not getting close to people. A little girl tries to come up and hug her and thank her for killing the Yoma. She kicks the girl away, you know, get away from me. Same exact vibe. Basically, same thing that we'd already seen in Volume 1. But then, uh, as the child begins to kind of warm up to Teresa, Teresa warms up to the child and everything, Teresa decides to name the child, and she names her Claire. And the very first thing that I thought was that, okay, Teresa is connected to Claire in some way, and they had, like, maybe a falling out or something like that, and so she's naming this child after Claire that she, she cares about. But then... It, you know, that was a stupid mistake on my part where you actually realize that, no, this is a flashback and we were actually talking about our main character, Claire, as a child and how she was introduced to this world of the Claymore and everything like that. So that was pretty much, much a, like the shocking twist of it that we are now into a flashback. Who knows how long this flashback is going to last and what exactly it's going to cover. It definitely is a Claire origin story. However, the flashback itself is focusing way more on the Teresa character, which leads me to think uh, either one of two things. Either one is that Teresa is going to die a tragic death that sets up who Claire is and what Claire actually wants to do within the Claymore organization, or Teresa is going to take a turn for the worse, become a full Yoma or something like that. We're setting up a main antagonist with ties to the main character. So I don't really know which direction it's going to go in, but that's where it's at so far. Um, the other thing to mention about volume three before I get into volume four is that there is this moment. There's a couple of things that we learn in volume three. Uh, one is that Claymores are not allowed to kill humans. Now, again, I feel like this might be in part of like the conspiracy theory to help keep control over the, the Yoma situation and the Claymores themselves. And perhaps it's just a precautionary measure because if a Claymore did wind up killing a human, could that potentially mean that the Yoma blood has taken over too far? And so now is the time to kill the Claymore. But they don't really uh, they don't really go too much into detail on that. It just seems to be like a plain cut and dry rule that they have. And the interesting thing to me about that is that there are times, obviously, when you have horrible human beings like the bandits in these volumes that, you know, pillage and rape and do whatever the hell that is that they're doing. And it's like, okay, so a Claymore can't, you know, dispatch these humans. They can't use their sort of own uh, um, subjective uh, reasoning within the situation in order to kill the humans. They're just not allowed to kill them. So if a human is to do something horrible, the Claymore literally just has to stand by and let it happen. They're only allowed to kill Yoma. So to me, this is just another giant red flag of whatever the Claymore organization is because now you're you're controlling people to the point where you're making them basically be lone warriors. You're controlling people to the point where obviously you're infecting them with the Yoma blood to begin with. And now also you're denying their ability to act righteously by killing humans in a situation where they need to or need to defend themselves or anything like that. So this is there's a lot of like red flags that are really jumping out to me about whatever the Claymore organization is and how well they buy into it. Uh, again, with these volumes, we haven't learned what happens when a male is infected with the Claymore blood, which I'm still very curious about that. Why is it only female? Is it another like control thing? You know, I, we're not, I'm not really sure. And then Teresa has this really strange moment where the bandits are gonna like basically like assault her sexually or whatever. And uh, she kind of opens her cloak and shows them her body and they're like, uh, no. And like, I'm pretty sure this isn't a scene from the end of Sleepaway Camp where she actually has a dick. I'm pretty sure this is something about either her body being uh, contorted or manipulated or maybe looks like a Yoma, like on the human flesh side, maybe like the Yoma starts to take over and her like demonic, she looks like just, you know, like rough, like lizard like skin. I, I, I don't I don't really know. I'm just kind of coming up with ideas. I mean, I'm sure a lot of bandits back in like the Middle Ages wouldn't really care. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they would probably still go for it if they could. But according to this volume, it was so off putting that a group of asshole like marauding male bandits still decided they didn't want to attempt to assault Teresa. So to me, that means that something really, really off has to be about her body, and we're not really sure what that is. So volume four begins that we have a little bit more of a bonding moment between Teresa and uh, and Claire, which is really nice to see. It's cool to see Claire as a child. She seems very like clung on to Teresa, the same way that Racky kind of clings on to Claire. So you see that similarity there. 
also sort of like leads you to understand why Claire was probably eventually okay with Racky tagging along and everything. It was a very similar situation, though with how this situation is turning out to be, maybe that's also why she was standoffish at first and she didn't want him joining him because uh, who knows what's going to happen with this situation and it's probably going to go south really bad, especially for Claire. And eventually she has to be infected anyway, so, so probably not good for her. But the bandits do return and uh, come after Claire after Teresa leaves her at the village. Teresa runs back, gets extremely pissed off at the devastations they caused and how they harmed Claire and went off on them and basically butchered all of these humans, which is the big taboo against the rules. And so now the Claymores are coming to kill Claire, which again, like... Is there not some situation somewhere where it would be reasonable for a claymore to kill a human? Like, like that's such a that's such a bad rule for them to have, and I can't think for any other reason for that to be a rule other than it's just some sort of semblance of control or some sort of uh, you know just a precautionary measure just in case the reason they killed the human, like not even reasoning with them or talking to them, just they just assume well if you killed a human then the yoma in you has probably activated, which just doesn't seem this doesn't seem right, but whatever. So we're introduced to four new characters that if you're basically ranking all the claymores and how powerful they are, Teresa was number one. So we get other characters that are introduced, uh, so I had to write them down so I would remember them all. I'm sure I'll remember them more as the story goes on, but it's Noel, Sophia, Elena, and Priscilla. And uh, they're all very unique, and they're all very different in their own ways. Uh, we haven't really got a chance, at least as far as the end of Volume 4, to really get into their personality traits, except for the character of Priscilla. Now, Priscilla is presented as a character who seems to be very uh, righteous in her own way, and a very, again, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier in the review, like a very black and white uh, view of how things work, that Yoma are bad, people are good, they kill the Yoma, and that's it, and if you disobey the rules of the Claymore, then you have to be subject to whatever the punishments are. Now, Priscilla has, like, a very, um, innocent vibe to her at first, and it sort of reminds me of a character from Roni Kenshin, if you've read that manga, it sort of reminds me of the character of Sojiro, and Sojiro, uh, just not to go into like whole Kenshin lore or anything in this video, but Sojiro was a young boy character that grew up in traumatic circumstances and sort of had to make himself numb to things in order to survive the, the horrible things he was going through. So he had a very, uh, he always carried a smile on his face. He always seemed very calm. He never really got emotional about anything. And that sort of gives me the same vibe as Priscilla, at least so far, where she's just a very calm like understanding like this is black and white like this is the way things is and there's no in between and that allows her to be calm because she has that sort of moral judgment within her mind where she's like she doesn't have to question if something is good or bad she just does the thing and makes her very hard to read because it seems like she doesn't have a lot of emotion to her and she doesn't get she doesn't get very angry or at least i could be misreading this people could be re watching this review being like bro dude you have no fucking idea <laughs> like she goes crazy later on which might be true but at least as far as volume four it seems like that's the sort of persona that she has and she's incredibly powerful without having to use any of her Yoma ability, which means she's just like a skilled swordsman as it is, and she's able to use a lot of her swordsmanship skills without tapping into that self, thus allowing her to be a Claymore for longer periods of time. But as we learn towards the final chapter of Volume 4, that is pretty much the same way that Teresa does things. So that sort of is the added benefit of the Claymores, is that, yeah, you get this enhanced ability from the Yoma blood, but if you're already, like, a badass skilled swordsman before that, or become one, then the more limited you having to access that part of yourself is, thus the longer you can be a Claymore. Uh, so, right now, that battle is going down. Priscilla is fighting Teresa, with, uh, young Claire just sort of watching in the wings and being able to see what happens. Um... Now, if I had to predict what was happening next, I would, at this point, at this point, I would probably lean more towards Teresa becoming a Yoma fully and maybe killing off most of these characters uh, with the exception, exception of Priscilla because she seems like she's going to be pretty important. And, uh, and this sort of leads into Claire's backstory, and then Claire will be taken or abducted, and the experiment will be done on her as well, and that's how she became a Claymore, and maybe she's searching for Teresa in order to, 
to finally like put an end to her or whatnot. I'm not sure, but that's sort of like, that's an idea I have of where things could be moving. But yeah, other than that, guys, I'm really digging this volume. This was a pretty sweet volume. Uh, these two volumes were pretty good. The story is picking up. Definitely excited for it. I have volume five in the physical, so very excited to read that as opposed to reading it online. I'm super excited to actually read the physical volume. So I'll be getting a volume five review out to you guys as soon as I can. Uh, a couple of things to note before you click off this video. Before you click off, guys, uh, I would really appreciate it if you liked the video and gave it a comment because I want to be able to continue doing these volume reviews of Claymore, but they need to hit in the algorithm a little bit more uh, because YouTube starts to suppress your videos and it's gonna like, it's gonna block me from people's For You pages and subscription feeds and stuff if the videos don't do uh, better. So I hopefully this gets a little bit more views. We really, really appreciate it if you help share it around. If you have uh, Claymore fans, whatnot, that you want to share it with, I'd really appreciate it if you kind of shared it around there and give the video a thumbs up and all that kind of fun stuff. Subscribe if you want to stick around. Also, in case you guys don't know, um, I am going to be moving locations very, very soon as the middle of next week. So there might be a little bit of gap of time without videos that I won't be able to do the reviews for maybe like a week or a week and a half, two weeks. I don't really know the full time frame of what it's going to be. So I'm going to try to at least do one more Claymore review as long as this video does well before the move. And then it might be a little bit of gap of time before I, I get back into it. But I'll get back into it as soon as I possibly can, as soon as I get the internet set up at my new location and, and uh, get my computer set up and everything. So hopefully that will turn out pretty well. Other than that, guys, as always, thank you for watching. Really do appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. And uh, here, here's uh, here's whiteboard Teresa and Mini Claire before you go again, just so you can uh, you can appreciate my art and my uh, my drawing skills. Yeah.